Good evening. We're going to spend this evening talking about preparing for your exam to your lecture exam. So I'm going to go through the study guide or the review, that the written review, and then we'll talk about some of the subjects and look at some figures. And keep in mind, this is a guide to help you study. It's important that you especially have looked at the chapters and that you've watched the videos. Um, or any of the extra information that's posted in each lesson to help you prepare for the exam. So we begin with lesson five, which is on the plasma membrane. And we know that this plasma membrane is mostly made of a phospholipid bilayer. And we'll look at what that, what exactly that looks like in just a minute. And a phospholipid has two basically two different components. It has polar heads um, and so it depends on how you want to phrase this. So the heads are both pointing out side of the cell and they're pointing into the cell. And the hydrophobic tails, the other part of the phospholipid, are pointing toward the tails of the second of the other layer. Okay, and we'll look at that in just a second. The fluid mosaic model just means that in addition to the phospholipids that make up the plasma membrane, there are proteins that are embedded in that membrane, there are there's cholesterol, there's other molecules. And so the way that these proteins and cholesterol and other molecules are in the membrane is not a regular pattern, and it's also fluid. They can move um, among these phospholipids. Now, what is the, the whole goal or what's the function of the plasma membrane? Well, the plasma membrane is like the gatekeeper, okay? It allows certain molecules to pass in or out of the cell while, while excluding other molecules. Typically, the small uncharged molecules are those that are going to freely pass across the membrane. And the reason that large molecules can't pass, they're simply the size is too big to fit through the membrane layers, but also charged molecules, okay, don't cross because the interior part of this phospholipid is high, whoops, excuse me, yeah, hydrophobic. Okay, which means water hating. Well, charged or polar molecules are hydrophilic or water loving, and we know that water and oil don't mix, and so these are not able to cross that hydrophobic portion of the membrane. So again, hydrophilic just means water loving. These would this would be water, polar molecules, anything charged. Hydrophobic is water fearing. So this would be like oil when you try to mix oil and water. Now, before we move to cell transport, let's take just a minute to look at some of the phospholipid bilayer so we can just review that for a second. So here is like a chunk of the plasma membrane. So you can imagine that this membrane would continue on, right, and it would make a cell like this. And we're just looking at it, one piece, one chunk of that plasma or cell membrane. So it's in a bilayer, meaning this would be one layer, right, of the phospholipids, and this would be the second layer. And notice the way that the phospholipids orient. The, the polar heads all point to the interior of the cell, which is mostly water, right? So we've got hydrophilic heads pointing to the interior of the cell, and then we've got the hydrophilic heads that are pointing out, out of the cell into the um, extracellular area or fluid, which is also mostly water. And then sandwiched in between that are the hydrophobic tails. So this is the part, this interior part, the tails is the part that prevents the charged polar molecules from crossing through. They're repelled, okay, when they try to cross through the membrane. Okay, so moving on, let's see, we left off at cell transport. So we should certainly understand diffusion and osmosis, and these are related, but they're different processes. So diffusion, 
is when we say, okay, we're talking about solute molecules. So remember, we have a solvent, and we have a solute. The solvent is what the solute is dissolved in. So for the most part, we, we've talked about water as the solvent. The solute is what is being dissolved. So diffusion refers to the solute. And what it says is, without ex expending any energy, solute molecules are going to move from where they're most concentrated to where they're less concentrated, or they're going to move down their concentration gradient, and that requires no energy. Now, osmosis is specifically dealing with the movement of water molecules. But it says the same thing. It says water is going to move from where water is most concentrated to where water is least concentrated, which means that water is moving toward a more concentration of solute molecules. Now, the reason that this occurs is in the case where we have a, a plasma membrane. So let me just look at, look at the whiteboard here. Let's say that we have a cell. Okay, and we have a molecule that is polar or charged, and therefore it's unable to cross the plasma membrane. So let's say that outside of the cell we have sodium ions and chloride ions, okay, and they're much more concentrated outside the cell. And we don't have, we have very few inside the cell. Well, these charged molecules like sodium ion and chloride ion, they are unable to cross the plasma membrane. So diffusion would say that they want to or they will diffuse from where they're more concentrated to where they're least concentrated, which would mean that they would diffuse into the cell, but that can't happen because they're charged. So water is able to move across the membrane. So what we have is osmosis is going to occur because of the difference in charge across the membrane. So water molecules, which are now more concentrated inside the cell because there's no salt or very little salt, the water will diffuse out of the cell. Okay. So remember, diffusion is going to occur with solute molecules as long as they can diffuse down their concentration gradient. When we see osmosis is when we have solute molecules that have differing concentrations inside versus outside the cell, but they're unable to diffuse because they can't cross the plasma membrane. In that situation, osmosis will occur. Now let's look at some examples. Okay, these are red blood cells. And they're, they're placed in three different solutions. So the, the first one on the left, what we see here is, this is a hypertonic solution. Hypertonic means more solute. So if you think about a hyperactive child has more energy, hypertonic solution has more solute. And that more than what, it means more than the cell. So in this case, we're talking about a solute that can't diffuse across the plasma membrane like sodium chloride, okay? Now, red blood cells have a salt concentration of about 0.9% salt. So a hypertonic solution would mean it's more than that. So let's say that the hypertonic solution has about a 10% salt concentration. What's going to happen since the, since the sodium chloride can't diffuse, water is going to move to try to um, equalize the difference in the solute. So that means water is always moving to the hypertonic situation, whether it's hypertonic outside the cell or inside the cell, water is always going to move to the hypertonic situation where there's more solute. So in this case, water moves out of the cell into the solution, and we, we end up with these deflated cells, and this is called crenation, okay, or the cells have become crenate. Now, in the middle situation, isotonic means it's when the concentration in the solution is the same as what's inside the cell, so this would be 0.9% salt. Which, which is the same as the salt concentration inside the cell. 
So it doesn't mean that there's no movement of water. There is. There's just no net movement. Some water's moving in, some water's moving out, but we don't have a net movement of water. So we have the healthy biconcave disc shape to the red blood cell. And the third situation in a hypotonic, hypo means less. So that means there's, let's say, 0% salt in this solution. So there's actually more inside the cell because the cell has 0.9%. So water's going to move to the hypertonic environment, which in this case is the cell, right, because the solution's hypo. So what will happen an animal cell like this, a red blood cell, the plasma membrane will actually rupture, and this is called hemolysis, or the, the cells have become hemolyzed. Now let's look at the same situation, um, how, how it plays out with the plant cell. So the big, the big difference is, an animal cell doesn't have a cell wall, but a plant cell does. So that we're not going to have the, the rupturing of the plasma, or yeah, the plasma membrane because we have a cell, more rigid cell wall there. So in the hypertonic condition, the same thing, hypertonic solution means that water is going to move to the hypertonic environment, and there you see that we have this shriveled up cell. The, the cytoplasm shrivels in, okay, the vacuole becomes very, uh, it loses a lot of water. And in a plant cell, this is called plasmolysis, or the plant cell has become plasmalized, and that will give a really wilty look to a plant. In the isotonic situation, right, we have no net movement of water. But in the hypotonic situation, this is a normal, healthy, plant cell that is what we call turgid or has turgor pressure. And that's because the water diffuses into the plant cell, fills up the vacuole, that presses out against the cell wall that gives the plant nice, good structure. So when you forget to water your plant for a few days and it looks like this over here, then you water it and give it some time and it begins to look healthy like this again. So let's go through, we've talked about these terms, okay? We talked about a hypotonic solution, which has less solute. Uh, plant cells become turgid because the vacuole, right, that central vacuole fills with water. But the red blood cell will swell and burst, and this is called hemolysis. Hypertonic solutions have more solute than the cell, so water flows out of the cell. We mentioned that plant cells will become plasmalized. Red blood cells become what we call crenate. Isotonic, we have no net movement. Now we need to talk a little bit about how cells can take molecules in um, or <clears throat> send molecules out. So when they take molecules in, it's called endocytosis. And when molecules are, are allowed out of the cell, it's called exocytosis. And we have different types of endocytosis. So there's one, exocytosis is the exiting. We, we talk about endocytosis in a couple of different forms. Phagocytosis is when it's large molecules. Pinocytosis is when it is liquids or very small molecules, like really small. And receptor-mediated endocytosis is when there is a receptor on the cell membrane that is targeted for a particular molecule. So it is a very specific um, molecule when it binds those receptors that are taken in. Active transport is when a cell has to actually expend energy in order to move a molecule. So with diffusion and osmosis, there was no energy expended, but with active transport, the cell does have to expend energy. All right. 
So that um, concludes our lesson five review. Let's move on to lesson six. Um, Law of conservation of energy states that energy cannot be created or destroyed. <clears throat> but it can change from one form to another. So for example, kinetic to potential, potential to kinetic, <clears throat> pardon me. This, we also know that energy cannot be changed from one form to another without, first of all, a loss of usable energy and also without an increase in disorder or entropy. So we should understand the difference between kinetic and potential energy. Kinetic is the energy of motion. And specifically, because we're going to talk about photosynthesis later, light energy is the energy of motion. That is kinetic energy. Potential energy is, is one example that we, we need to understand for this, this unit is potential energy is the energy that is stored in chemical bonds. Okay, so between atoms, those bonds are actually considered potential energy. Entropy, as we mentioned, is a measure of disorder or randomness in the atmosphere, in the world, in the earth. ATP or adenosine triphosphate is the energy currency of cells, meaning this is how the cells get work done, right? If cell wants to move a molecule um, with active transport, it expends ATP to do so. Cell wants to produce something, it expends ATP to do that. So this is the way that cellular work gets done. Without ATP, a cell doesn't have the energy it needs to function, therefore it dies. Okay, what else do we need to know about ATP? Well, it looks similar to a nucleotide in that it has a sugar. It has this nitrogenous base, okay, the, the nitrogenous base adenine. But then it has three phosphate groups. So a, a DNA nucleotide only has one where it has three phosphate groups. We're going to look at it in just a second, but I want to get through this. The way ATP works, it, it, a bond gets broken which essentially cleaves off or breaks the bond between the second to the third and the third phosphate. That's the high energy bond. What you're left with when that bond is cleaved is adenosine diphosphate, so di, di meaning two, you have two phosphates left, and you've cleaved off one phosphate group. Now, this process happens over and over and over in the cell so many times. ATP is expended, and to ADP, and then the, the nutrients in the food that you eat um, are used, and we're talk, we'll talk about that in the next lesson, cellular respiration, to build up more ATP. That ATP is used to do something for the cell, and the process continues. So ADP is continually being regenerated into ATP after the ATP is broken down. Now let's look at... how this works. So ATP is the high energy molecule. This is like a hundred dollar bill. It's got the three phosphates on it. The cell uses it for all kinds of things. Here are a few examples. Okay, Biosynthesis meaning producing molecules like proteins in the cell. Some kind of detoxification process. Okay, And keeping your body temperature regulated. Transporting ions across the membrane. Because remember ions can't cross on their own or muscle contraction, moving around, keeping your posture, doing exercise. Any of these things are going to require uh, ATP to be spent, which essentially means that bond is broken, and this one phosphate group is cleaved off, and you're left with ADP. Now, the ADP is regenerated to the high energy form of ATP by the food that you eat. And this process, taking this food, the food source, and converting it into ATP, that whole process we're going to talk about next, 
is cellular respiration. Now let's look at the actual ATP molecule. So I mentioned that there was the sugar, so this ribose, this is the sugar. This part here is the nitrogenous base. You can see all the nitrogens there. Okay, that's the adenine base. And then we have one phosphate, two phosphates, three phosphate groups. It's this last phosphate group, okay? This is the high energy bond where you cleave off this last or gamma phosphate. And if that gets cleaved off, you're left with just two or ADP. Okay, let's talk for a little bit about enzymes. So first of all, I want to make sure we understand enzymes are a type of protein. So there is a gene. Every gene produces a protein, and some of those proteins are enzymes. Enzymes usually end in ASE, catalase, um, lipase, dehydrogenase. That's, that's how enzymes are typically named. Now, what do we mean by catalyst? Well, a catalyst is something that gets a reaction started. And that's exactly what an enzyme does. It's a protein which lowers something that's required for a reaction to occur, which is called the energy of activation or activation energy. We'll look at that in just a minute. But basically, every chemical reaction has a certain amount of energy that is required just to get the process started. An enzyme lowers the amount of energy it, re it requires for a cell to get a reaction started. Now, an enzyme, because it's a protein, proteins have three-dimensional structure. And therefore, an enzyme has an active site, so that's a, a position on the enzyme. And, and it has typically a very specific substrate in which it interacts with. So think about a lock and key for your front door. A key is specific to one lock, just like an enzyme would be specific to one substrate in most cases. Now, an enzyme is many times part of a metabolic pathway. What does this mean, metabolic pathway? It means that there are multiple steps where an enzyme, well, there's, pardon me, multiple enzymes that it takes in a process. For example, in the next few lessons, we're going to talk about cellular respiration and photosynthesis. You'll see that these are multi-step processes, and there is an enzyme that catalyzes each reaction in each step of that process. Now, an enzyme can be inhibited, and there are a couple ways. They can either be in inhibited by a competitive inhibitor or inhibited by a non-competitive inhibitor. And basically, this depends on where the inhibitor binds the enzyme. A competitive inhibitor is going to bind at the active site. So in other words, it's competing with the substrate for the same spot on the enzyme. The non-competitive inhibitor, or the allosteric inhibitor, doesn't bind to the active site. It binds somewhere else on the enzyme. But by binding there, it actually changes the three-dimensional shape of the enzyme, and then it no longer um, can allow the substrate into the active site because of that change in shape. Something called the induced fit model explains that when an enzyme and a substrate come together, there's a slight change in the structure or the three-dimensional shape of the enzyme to make it have a nice solid fit with the substrate. The last thing I want to mention about enzymes before we move on and, we, and I show you some, some diagrams about enzymes is that because their three-dimensional structure is so important to their activity, that they can become what we call denatured, which essentially means that their shape, their three-dimensional shape has changed. Their, their folding has been altered, so they don't have the same three-dimensional shape. 
therefore they can't bind their substrate, they can't catalyze their reaction. How are ways that remember enzymes are not living, right? They're they're a macro they're a macromolecule, but they're not living, so we can't say they're killed. We, we say they're denatured because they're non-functional. Some of the things that denature an enzyme are extreme heat or extreme pH. Now all enzymes have an optimum pH and an optimum temperature, meaning the pH and the temperature in which they function the best. In other words, they're going to give the best reaction rate at that temperature or at that pH. So ex temperature is much higher than that or, or pH is either higher or lower than their optimum can cause them to, first of all, they're not going to function well, but as you get more extreme, it will cause them to lose their function. So let's have a look at we talked about the energy of activation. I want to explain a little bit about that. So in, in this um, chart or graph, we have energy increasing on the y-axis and the reaction movement increasing this way. So in other words, this is our starting material down on this end and this is the product of the reaction. So we see that the reactants have a certain amount of energy, the products have a certain amount of energy, but notice that it doesn't go directly from reactant directly to products. Instead, it takes a, a pretty good input of energy to get this process started. Okay, this purple line shows you that's how much energy it would be required by the cell to get this reaction started without an enzyme. But the red dashed line shows you that with an enzyme, because the enzyme is bringing the substrate into close proximity, um, it lowers the amount of energy that the cell has to put forward, which makes this reaction actually move forward. So that's what, when I say energy of activation or activation energy, that's, that's what I'm referring to. Okay. Now we're going to go back to our review sheet here. All right, we're moving on to um, lesson seven, cellular respiration. And I want to make sure I spend some time here so we understand there's a lot going on in this lesson. So the first thing is we need to talk about what, what is the chemical equation, right, for this process for cellular respiration. So we're going to do that in just a second. And I also want you to see, because photosynthesis is our next lesson, I want you to see how these relate to one another. What's the overall point of this? And we're going to talk about what in the world a, re a redox reaction is, what's being reduced, and what's being oxidized. But I'm just going to use a blank sheet for us to talk about this for a minute. So first of all, we're going to look at cellular respiration. And I'm going to write the reaction out here. But then remember that this is going to be carried out in multiple steps. Okay. So we have glucose, C6H12O6, plus six molecules of oxygen, yields six molecules of CO2, six molecules of water, plus, we're going to put here a question mark, a certain amount of ATP. So the first thing I want you to see about this reaction is what is the overall goal? What is the point? Okay, remember that we're using glucose as, as the molecule that we're following through, but all sugars, all carbohydrates, all proteins, all fats that you take into your diet will go through a similar process where they'll be broken down into smaller molecules to produce ATP. So we're using glucose as our one example, but it happens for all of the energy-containing molecules that you have in your diet. So keep in mind the goal is this, to make ATP, energy currency for the cell, okay? That's why we eat our food, so that we can produce energy so our cells can do the cellular work that they need to do. 
So the other thing that I see here is the need for oxygen, right? Oxygen is a reactant. Without oxygen, this whole reaction doesn't happen, okay? Then what, what are my products, which in this case, a product in this, in this particular situation, this is a waste, right? Carbon dioxide is a waste gas. Then we just need to get rid of it. And then we produce some water. This right here is exactly why you have to breathe. You need a constant supply of oxygen for all of your cells so that they can carry out this process to make energy. And in doing that, they're going to produce a certain amount of carbon dioxide. Your blood has to carry that carbon dioxide back to your lungs where you exhale it out to get rid of that waste gas. So that's the big, that's sort of the big picture of why this is going on. Now, the other thing I want you to see is glucose has six carbons in it. Every one of those six carbons ends up as a carbon of carbon dioxide. Oxygen, on the other hand, okay, is getting reduced into water. Now, I've already given this away a little bit. Okay, this is what we call a redox reaction because one molecule gets reduced while another molecule gets oxidized. Let's find out what's being reduced. Reduce means gaining electrons. Oxidize means losing electrons. We can also say if you gain hydrogens or, or lose hydrogens, it's like if you've gained electrons or lost electrons. So if we look at glucose, okay, on this side, this is the only carbon-containing molecule. So it is becoming carbon dioxide. We lost a lot of hydrogens, meaning we lost a lot of electrons. So glucose is being oxidized into carbon dioxide. Oxygen, on the other hand, gained hydrogens or gained electrons, so oxygen is being reduced. Now, we're going to look at this in detail to see how, does, how is this process carried out because this actually goes through three phases. So glycolysis, Krebs cycle, or called the citric acid cycle also, and the electron transport chain. So all these um, carry out this overall reaction. So we're going to go through that in detail in just a second. But I want to show you one thing before we move on. I'm going to have to erase this to do it. At least erase part of it. Well, I think we'll erase the whole thing. All right. So I'm going to put up here cellular respiration one more time. Okay, there's our cellular respiration. Now I'm going to put photosynthesis here, okay? So what I want you to notice is these reactions are just the inverse of one another. With cellular respiration, we started with glucose and oxygen. With photosynthesis, glucose and oxygen are the products. With cellular respiration, we end up with carbon dioxide and water. With photosynthesis, those are the starting materials. So these work so nicely together, right? Now, one other thing I want to point out, we always mention that plants, and of course algae and a few other organisms, photosynthesize. Plants do this also, right? Living things, animals, plants, bacteria, fungi, they're all doing this process. So plants do both. 
All right, moving on. So we've answered these questions. Uh, the three phases of glucose breakdown, excuse me, I just mentioned those. Glycolysis, and I'm going to put this time, I'm going to put citric acid cycle, which is the same as the Krebs cycle. Okay, and then ETC, the electron transport chain, or we can say oxidative phosphorylation. Now, where do these happen in the cell? Okay, well, we want to associate cellular respiration with the mitochondria because that's where a lot of it occurs. But, but glycolysis actually occurs in the cytoplasm. The rest of the process is going to occur in the mitochondria. What are the products of glycolysis? Okay, I want us to go through glycolysis in a minute. And then we'll come back and answer this. Or you can go ahead, if you want to write down, the carbon-containing product is 2, by, two pyruvates. We also get 2 ATP out of glycolysis and 2 of something called NADH. And what NADH molecules are? They're electron carriers. So. We know that chemical bonds are made of electrons, and we know that they are potential energy, can chemical bonds are potential energy. So as, as this larger glucose molecule is broken down into smaller molecules, the electrons in those bonds are transferred to an NADH molecule. These are electron carriers. So that's what I want you to think about when, when you think about those. Let's go to glycolysis and talk about this process together for a minute. Do you need to know the names of all of these enzymes? No, you do not. But what I want you to see is, remember I mentioned to you before that many times enzymes are in metabolic pathways, meaning you have multiple enzymes and it, and it takes multiple steps to get to a product. So each one of those is an enzyme and this is a metabolic pathway that we're discussing. So we start with glucose. Here's what I need us to do. We're going to keep track of all six carbons in glucose as we go through. Okay. Interestingly enough, at the beginning of glycolysis, remember this is glycolysis, so we're, we're in the cytoplasm. At the beginning of this process, the cell actually has to make an investment of ATP. Now remember, the overall goal of this whole process is to produce ATP for the cell. But right off the bat, there has to be an investment of ATP. So we're, we're negative 2 ATP right now. The cell has invested 2 ATP in this process. Um, notice that we have some rearrangement of molecules going on. And at this step here, the 6-carbon molecule is broken up into two 3-carbon molecules. So we've still got all six carbons. They've been broken up, though, into two separate molecules. So we're going to continue on. We're picking up where we left off, so it, it's moving this direction. Okay. Here are the two molecules. So it's taking this molecule through this process right to the end. So multiply all of this times 2 because this molecule would do the same thing, right? We have two of these. So at the, at the end of this process, notice we get an ATP out here. We get a, if the, if the ATP comes out of the arrow, that means it was produced. Okay, so one ATP there, one ATP there, and we end up with a three carbon pyruvate. Now we have to multiply all those by 2 because we have two of these 1,3 bisphosphoglycerates that go through this process, right? Because there are two of these for every one glucose. So 2 ATP here, 2 ATP here, and 2 pyruvate. Now we invested ATP, so that means that we actually net a total of 2 ATP out of the whole process of glycolysis. What we have as far as our carbon-containing molecules is two molecules of pyruvate, and we still 
six carbons that we started with. Okay, so we've, we've, we're here at what is substrate level ATP synthesis. Okay, ATP synthesis means the production of ATP. We just said that we produce two ATP with glycolysis. Substrate level means that the enzyme took a phosphate molecule, uh, a phosphate group from one molecule and transferred it directly to ADP to make ATP. So it's a direct transfer of a phosphate group from enzyme from one substrate to another by an enzyme. That's all substrate level phosphorylation means. Think about enzyme substrate. That's the word, that's where it's occurring. And it's going to make sense to you in a little bit why I make a point about substrate level phosphorylation because we we have another type of phosphorylation that's going to occur later in this process. All right, how many ATP did we invest? We invested two. Okay. Now we're moving on to the next process, which is the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. And we're going we're gonna to go through this in detail, but at the end of the process, what you're going to see is there are going to be six NADH, two FADH2, and two ATP that are produced by the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. Now there's one step that has to occur between glycolysis and the, and the Krebs cycle, and I like to call it the PrEP step or the PrEP reaction. We're going to look at that. Remember that we got two of these pyruvate molecules out of glycolysis. Well, it just so happens that what enters into the Krebs cycle is this molecule right here. It's, it's an acetyl group onto a coenzyme, coenzyme A. And a coenzyme is like an enzyme helper. Now notice that an acetyl group only has two carbons, whereas our pyruvate had three carbons. So we see in this PrEP step or PrEP reaction the first oxidation of carbon into carbon dioxide. So right here, okay, so in other words, pyruvate goes through this reaction. We get an acetyl group bonded to a CoA as a product, and be, one of those carbons gets oxidized into a CO2 at that point. Now remember, we have two pyruvate, so this, this happens twice, which means we're going to get two molecules of CO2. The other thing we see is we also get an additional two molecules of NADH, which are those electron carriers that are accepting electrons from the bonds in glucose as glucose is being slowly broken down. So now we're ready to enter into the Krebs cycle, the citric acid cycle, and this is the molecule that will enter. So we have two of these, right, because we had two pyruvates. So we're, we're t the reason I say we have two is we're doing it based on one molecule of glucose. So moving forward, let's look at the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. There's a lot going on in this cycle, so I want to point out to you the key things for you to know. The first, this is our acetyl CoA. This is where it's entering into the cycle. Okay, it enters right here. And what it's doing is it's combining with a four carbon molecule called oxaloacetate that's already formed. So essentially, our two carbons, here's one carbon, here's two from our acetyl group, are hitching a ride onto this oxaloacetate, which already had four carbons. So four plus two is six. Okay, so what we get is a molecule of citrate. Now, this goes through some, each step of this pathway, there's an enzyme, right, the, that catalyzes the reaction. And I want you to see several things. First of all, we have the production of more NADH. We have the oxidation of carbon into carbon dioxide. Production of more NADH oxidation of more carbon into carbon dioxide, 
And this just just this says GTP, which is essentially the same thing as ATP. It just depends on the cell type. So we're going to consider that ATP. Okay, here's another production of NADH. So remember, we, this cycle we go around one full turn for each acetyl group that goes through the cycle. So we multiply everything by two because we have two of these acetyl groups for every glucose molecule. So since we had three NADHs times two, that would be a total of six NADH for every glucose. Okay, multiply the ATP times two, two ATP. And there's another molecule that we haven't talked about yet, and that's FADH2. It's just another type of electron carrier that's similar to NADH. So we have two FADH2s. Now how much CO2? Two CO2 for every acetyl group, so that makes it four CO2. What does that mean? That means at this point, every carbon of glucose has now been oxidized to carbon dioxide. We have no carbon containing molecules of glucose that are not carbon dioxide. So now you exhale them out and we're finished with the carbon dioxide. But what we're interested in as we move forward, besides obviously we've produced two ATP here and we produce two ATP in glycolysis, which is really a drop in the bucket to what we want to get out of glucose. But now what we're interested in are these molecules of NADH oops, and FADH2, okay? And remember, we, we, we already had two molecules of NADH from glycolysis, and we had two molecules of NADH from the prep step. So at this point, we have 10 total NADH. Okay, moving here. What is the function of NADH or FADH2? We already know these are electron carriers. Where are they getting these electrons? From the glucose as it's been broken down. So we want to know the structure of the mitochondria. We'll look at that and the location of the citric acid cycle. Okay, we'll look at that. And we want to understand the next step of the process, the electron transport chain. So this is the third part of the, the whole overall cellular respiration reaction. So let's have a look at that. Okay. What I want to make sure we understand, let's, let me draw a mitochondria organelle, okay? All right, so the mitochondria, we have an outer membrane, right? We have an inner membrane that's folded like this into these cristae. In the very centermost part, we have something called the matrix. And then in between the two membranes, we have the intermembrane space. This membrane right here, the inner membrane, is what you see here. Okay? These members of the electron transport chain, so these big blue proteins, these are the electron transport chain, and they're embedded in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So notice, this side of the membrane is the matrix, and this side is the intermembrane space. Now, the Krebs cycle, or the citric acid cycle, is occurring on the matrix side, and therefore, we have NADH and FADH2 molecules that we've just shown have been produced. What the NADH and FADH2 molecules do, remember they're carrying electrons from glucose. They're going to drop their electrons off 
into the electron transport chain. So NADH drops their, his or her, its electrons off here. FAD, FADH2 drops the electrons off here. Now, what do I need to understand about the electron transport chain? Well, those electrons actually get passed from one member of the electron transport chain to the next. So they, they're passed here, okay, and here, and here, and here. And as they're passed, this, the amount of energy that, that the electrons, so they move down in energy a little bit each time they're passed, and that amount of energy is actually used by the electron transport chain to move or pump a proton, so H plus is a proton, from the matrix side of the membrane to the intermembrane space side. Okay? So as those electrons are being passed from one member to the next, protons are being pumped from the matrix side to the intermembrane space side. Eventually, you're going to have a gradient, right? You're going to have a lot of protons that are built up on this side of the membrane. Now, several things that I want to point out to you here. First of all, notice that as the electrons get passed, there is a final destination, right? They have to end up somewhere. Oxygen gas is what is the final acceptor of these electrons. In other words, when this carrier passes the electrons to oxygen gas, that produces water, which is a product in our reaction. So we've already seen how the carbon dioxide product is produced. That's through the Krebs cycle and the prep step. Now we see where the water is produced. It's produced because oxygen gas accepts electrons from the electron transport chain, and that in, in doing that, it becomes water. If you, if you didn't have a fresh supply of oxygen, this process can't happen, and the Krebs cycle can't happen. All you can get, all you would get is glycolysis occurring, and we're going to talk about that at the very end in an aer anaerobic environment without oxygen. That's called fermentation, and we'll talk about that. Okay, now, what I want you to remember is that what we've generated so far with this electron transport chain is a proton gradient or a buildup of protons. Diffusion says, well, these protons are going to want to move from where they're most concentrated to where they're least concentrated, but they cannot do that. They're charged, right? So they can't cross through the plasma membrane. So we get a buildup of those on one side of the membrane. And notice it's the intermembrane space side that we have the buildup of protons. Okay, this is the same membrane, right? The inner membrane in the, in the mitochondria. And another enzyme that's embedded in the inner membrane is called ATP synthase. Synthase is to make, right? An enzyme that makes ATP. Remember that we have this proton gradient built up here on the inner membrane space side. Well, there happens to be a channel or a pore right in the middle of this ATP synthase enzyme that allows these protons to flow through down their concentration gradient. When they flow through the enzyme in this way, it allows the enzyme to add a phosphate group onto ADP, which generates ATP. Okay, this is called chemiosmotic phosphorylation because it's the chemical gradient, right? It's the buildup of those protons that is allowing this enzyme to do this. And if you if you think about, well, how are they, the, the best example or the best way to think about this is as they flow through, it's like when you go somewhere and as you walk through, you turn a turnstile, okay? It's like they're turning a turnstile that's allowing this ATP molecule to be generated. Now, <clears throat> Depending on the cell and the conditions, it can vary how much ATP is produced per glucose molecule. But for every NADH, you can, you can average about 3 ATP per NADH. 
For FADH2, it's about 2 ATP. So we had, we had 10 in ADH, so 10 times 3 would be 30. We had 2 FADH2, so 2 times 2 is 4. And then we already had 2 ATP from glycolysis and 2 ATP from the Krebs cycle, so that's another 4. That gives you a total of 38 ATP. In reality, though, the cell would have spent 2 ATP to shuttle all the NADH from the cytoplasm, all the NADH that was produced by glycolysis would cost some ATP. So in reality, we're talking about 36 molecules of ATP, and that's per glucose molecule. Now, I mentioned to you that without oxygen, no electron transport chain and no citric acid cycle. But glycolysis can occur in the absence of oxygen. And the way that that works is, so remember in, in typical glycolysis, glucose um, becomes two molecules of pyruvate. Two ATP are produced through this process. Normally, the pyruvate then would go on right through the prep step into the citric acid cycle, but let's say there's no oxygen, so this can't happen. Well, this process of glycolysis cannot continue to occur if we don't have NAD plus to accept the electrons of glucose to become NADH. So the NADH has to, has to send the electron somewhere, right, so that it can become NAD plus again. So the way that it happens, the pyruvate molecules will actually accept the electrons back from NADH, which means they become fermented or reduced into lactate or lactic acid. So in your muscle cells, when you're running really fast or working out really hard and your body's not used to that and you start to get that burning sensation, that's the lactic acid that's being produced in your muscle cells because you can't deliver enough oxygen there fast enough for um, the oxidative phosphorylation to occur. So this fermentation process is occurring. Now, we used to think that it was this lactic acid that caused muscle soreness after the fact, but there, there's there been some studies to show that that's not the case, that it's actually small micro tears in the muscles that actually are causing the soreness. All right, let's finish the last of this review sheet on cellular respiration. So. We talked about the structure of the mitochondria and the citric acid cycles and occurs in the matrix. We looked at the electron transport chain that it's located and embedded in the inner membrane. We looked at the products of the electron transport chain. We talked about that the, the hydrogen ion gradient, which is the same thing as the proton gradient, right? That those were generated as the electrons were passed from one carrier to the next. The carriers pumped the protons. The gradient was used to make ATP, right, using that enzyme ATP synthase. And we said you get about 36 ATP. So fermentation is when there's no oxygen. Whoops. And it's you just go through the process of glycolysis. Um, oh, I, I wanted to mention one thing. So lactic acid is what is produced in, in our muscle cells and in other um, eukaryotes, but there are organisms, yeast and bacteria, that when they go through fermentation, rather than producing lactic acid, they produce ethanol, So, which is the process of you know making beer, making wine. I um, forgot, almost forgot to mention that. Last lesson is on photosynthesis. So we talked a little bit about photosynthesis so far. Um, we're going to do the reaction again and we're going to talk about what's getting oxidized and what's getting reduced. Um, typically when we think about photosynthesis we think about plants, right? That plants are those that go that undergo photosynthesis. But um, also algae are able to photosynthesize and there are some bacteria called cyanobacteria 
that actually undergo photosynthesis. What produces the energy? Well, it's sunlight, right? The energy that drives this process is sunlight. And then we'll look, we'll look at the chloroplast, the structure of the chloroplast, but let's just go through the reaction quickly. All right, sorry. Here we go. So photosynthesis, as mentioned before, it's 6 CO2 plus 6 water. And I'm going to put this coming in like this, okay? Sunlight is the energy that's driving this reaction. Yields glucose plus oxygen gas, six of them. Okay. Now this is also a redox reaction, meaning that one molecule is getting reduced while another molecule is getting oxidized. So let's follow. This is carbon-containing molecule. This one's carbon-containing. That means water must be being converted into oxygen gas. All right. Reduction means gain electrons, or we can follow the hydrogens, gain hydrogens. So certainly carbon dioxide is becoming reduced because it's got we've got a lot of hydrogens here. Water is losing hydrogens or losing electrons, so it is being oxidized. Okay. Um, one thing that we mentioned previously in the semester was an endergonic and an exergonic reaction. So this would be an endergonic reaction because it requires an input of energy, input of sunlight. Cellular respiration would be an exergonic reaction because we get a release of energy, right? We're producing ATP through that process. All right, let's look at the chloroplast. So cellular respiration we associate with the mitochondria. Um, photosynthesis we are, um, should associate with the chloroplast. Now, chloroplast has a double membrane, so we see there's an outer membrane and an inner membrane. But then we have interior to that these little discs, right, that are called thylakoids or thylakoid discs. And a full stack of these discs is called granum, okay? The cell or the liquid that's in between the grana is called stroma. And what I want you to notice is that the discs are green in color, and they truly are green. This is what gives plants their green color. And they're green because of the chlorophyll pigment. So plants have chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B, and they are embedded in the thylakoid membranes. That means the thylakoid membrane, okay, is where the light reactions are happening. The light reactions we'll talk about in a minute. This is where the sunlight is being um, harnessed, right? The energy from the sun is being harnessed, um, and therefore it's it's the, the pigments are necessary because they are going to absorb this light energy. So light reactions occur in the thylakoid on in the membrane. The Calvin cycle, which is sometimes referred to as the dark reactions occurs in the stroma because it is not directly using sunlight or the chlorophyll pigments. Okay, let's look at the light reactions. There's a lot going on in this figure, so let's take our time and, and look at it. So first of all, this membrane is one of those little thylakoid discs, right? So this is the interior of the disc in here, and this is outside in the stroma. Okay, light energy. We have two different photosystems, okay? Photosystems is essentially a reaction center which has the pigments in it, and this is where the sunlight's gonna be harnessed. So this is one reaction or photosystem. 
This is another photo system. This one's named photo system two, named photo system one, because that's the order in which they were discovered and named. Both of these photo systems is, is, is responsible for absorbing sunlight, right, and harnessing that energy. So let's, let's go through and see what happens. So sunlight comes in. These chlorophyll pigments, okay, are able to absorb that particular certain wavelengths of light from the sun. We'll talk about that, uh, the specific wavelengths in a minute. They absorb those wavelengths of the sun, and they are able to um, shuttle or concentrate the energy that they, dis that they absorb to this reaction center, okay, in this photosystem. The, the, the energy then is transferred to a pair of electrons, which go up in energy level, right? They're, they're gaining the energy, essentially, from sunlight, okay? Now, what happens to those electrons that have been energized? Well, they get passed down an electron transport chain. Same idea that we saw in cellular respiration, okay? So the, the high energy electron gets passed, passed, passed from one carrier to the next in this electron transport chain. And the same thing is, is accomplished as the electrons are passed and they give off a little energy, protons get pumped, okay, from one side of the membrane to the other. Now, um, let's stop right there for a second and, and, and just keep in mind that we have an electron that that hasn't, we haven't quite said what, what its final destination is, so just put that on hold. Okay. Now, um, the other thing I want you to see, we had a pair of electrons. Uh, excuse me, I just drew this backwards. This is the stroma out here, sorry. These electrons are being pumped this direction. Okay, you can see the buildup of protons in the thylakoid space in here. Okay, excuse me about that. Now, back over here. We had electrons, right, that essentially got stripped from the reaction center, went up in energy level, and then they got passed down, and we end up with them here. We're, we're putting them on hold right here. But this reaction center now has to replace those electrons. Therefore, this is where plants produce oxygen. Electrons from water are taken to replace the electrons that shot up in energy level from sunlight. When you take electrons from water, you end up with oxygen gas. So it's in the light reactions that we see the production of oxygen. Okay, now I'm going to clear this off because this is getting really busy. Now we'll look at photosystem one and see what's happening. Same thing, sunlight is channeled, the energy from the sunlight is channeled by these chlorophyll pigments into the reaction center. That energy is transferred to a pair of electrons which, sh which shoot up an energy level. And this time, rather than getting passed down an electron transport chain, these, these electrons are transferred to NADP+, and it becomes NADPH. Now remember, with cellular respiration, we talked about NADH, which was an electron carrier. NADPH is similar. What I want you to think about, yes, it's an electron carrier, okay, and because it carries electrons, what are electrons? They are reducing, right? They can be reducing. So this NADPH is essentially reducing power, right, or potential. Whomever it drops these electrons off to is going to become reduced. And remember, in the overall reaction of photosynthesis, what are we doing? Well, we're reducing carbon dioxide into a sugar, into a glucose molecule. So we're going to need reducing power to do that. Now, here's what I want you to see. The electrons here, right, now have been delivered to NADP. So they have to be replaced by something. Well, what happens is this, these electrons that are ended up at the bottom of the electron transport chain from photosystem 2 replace the electrons that shot up an energy level from photosystem 1. 
So, what have we produced thus far? We produced NADPH. This is important. This is going to be needed by the Calvin cycle. In other words, the Calvin cycle's job is to make the glucose. The light reaction's job is to harness the sun's energy to produce what we need to make glucose later in the Calvin cycle. So we need basically two things in the Calvin cycle that, that the light reaction produce. We need NADPH, reducing power. We see where we get that. And we need ATP. We haven't produced, we haven't, I haven't shown you yet how the light reactions produce ATP, but we're about to do that. We've left off, we have our proton gradient, right? This is produced by the electron transport chain from the electrons that were energized by sunlight. Same process as cellular respiration. Protons cannot cross the membrane directly because they're charged. However, the ATP synthase molecule has a pore or channel that they flow through, turn that turnstile, and allow the enzyme to produce ATP. So again, to reiterate, the light reactions produce two things that are necessary for the Calvin cycle. NADPH, which is our reducing power, and ATP. So let's move on. Well, let's, let's go back and fill in some blanks, and then we'll go through the Calvin cycle. Okay, we talked about the chloroplast. All right, where do the light reactions occur? Okay, they occur, they occur in the thylakoid membrane, because remember, we have those chlorophyll pigments that are necessary to absorb sunlight. The Calvin cycle occurs in the stroma. We haven't, we haven't gone through the details of that yet. So I want you to look at the structure of the chloroplast, which we did. We looked at the light reactions. We saw photosystem one and two. Okay. And the chlorophyll is the pigment that absorbs, okay, energy from light or from sunlight. Now we haven't talked about this yet. What color of light does the chlorophyll not absorb? So the way things work, I, you, things are either absorbing a certain wavelength of light or they're reflecting it, okay? Something that appears a color, appears that color to your eye because it is reflecting that color. So a red shirt is absorbing all the colors but red, it's reflecting red, that's why it looks red to you. So the chlorophyll pigments are absorbing the other colors of light that are not green, but they're not absorbing green light, they're reflecting green light. So. I want to show you one thing really quickly. So in light energy, okay, so this is, this is what we're showing you here is the visible region of light. You probably learned Roy G. Biv, right? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And it, it's showing you that light travels in wavelengths. The longer the wavelength, the lower the energy. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy. So the violet light has a shorter wavelength and the highest energy, whereas red has the longer wavelength and the least amount of energy. Now, Let's look at these chlorophyll molecules, okay? And actually, we've got chlorophyll A, it's one type of chlorophyll, and chlorophyll B is another pigment that they both, they're both chlorophyll pigments, they just absorb a little bit different range of the wavelengths of light. And then this third pigment here is, is beta carotene. This is what, so carrots or sweet potatoes, things that have orange coloration, this is the pigment that causes them to look look that way. Here are all the wavelength of light in nanometers. This is just in their wavelength, right? How long or short their wavelength is. But it shows you the colors of them. So um, it's we start violet, 
and, and go the opposite way. So Roy G. Biv the opposite way. So you can see chlorophyll A is the solid line. You can see that as it goes up, this is the amount of light it's absorbing. And you see in the green range, we get like no absorption. It starts to go up for orange and yellow. Chlorophyll B, again, it's way down in the green, doesn't absorb any. Okay. Beta carotene has a little bit different uh, range. Notice that it does absorb in the green wavelength. It appears orange, so it doesn't absorb any light in the orange range, and then it absorbs again. Oh, no, that, that's uh, chlorophyll B. So then it, it doesn't absorb the rest of the wavelengths of light. Okay, so this walks you through what we looked at, the details of all of the light reactions, okay? The ATP in light reactions is produced from the proton gradient, right, that was, that was created by way of the electron transport chain. So, and, and then it talks about photosystem one there. Everything that's happened, remember we get our NADPH from photosystem one. Um, and this is the details about the production of ATP. Hydrogen moves down their concentration gradient and an enzyme called ATP synthase produces ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. Last topic of the night is the Calvin cycle, sometimes referred to as the dark reactions. Okay, it doesn't have to occur in the dark, it just means this particular reaction is, it does not directly make use of light. Now, it is dependent on the product of the light reactions. Remember, the light reactions produced ATP and they produced NADPH, which are going to be needed in the Calvin cycle. Okay. Here's the Calvin cycle. A few things I want to point out to you. First is, for every glucose molecule, we actually need six molecules of CO2, right? There are six carbons in glucose, therefore we would need six CO2s. But what I want you to see is, what, what this process is generating is something called G3P, okay, or GA3P, that's, that has three carbons. It takes two GA3Ps to make one molecule of glucose. So three CO2s make one GA3P. Six CO2s would make two of these, which would equal one full molecule of glucose. Okay. This enzyme Rubisco is very important because it does what we call carbon fixation. Okay. And what that means is it fixes or bonds this carbon dioxide, which is a gas, onto a sugar molecule, okay? So, again, like we saw with the, Cal uh, with, uh, the Krebs cycle, we have a molecule that we're going to essentially, or not we, Rubisco is going to bond a molecule of CO2 onto, okay? So, this is a one, two, three, four, five carbon molecule. Add a CO2 on and, you'll, and you get a six carbon molecule, okay? Um, that six carbon molecule will rearrange and you will have six molecules of a three carbon compound. Now I want to make sure we understand that it seems a little complicated and you don't have to remember all these details, but I want you to see that all the carbons of glucose are going to be coming from CO2. So we started with three molecules of this five carbon compound. So this was 15 carbons here. Three CO2s, that's plus three, would be 18 carbons. So these 18 carbons, right, all came from either RUBP or CO2. Now here's where you, you see the necessary products from the light reactions. ATP is needed and NADPH is needed to make six of these GA3P molecules. Okay, so we had 18 carbons. Six times three is still 18, so we've still got 18 carbons here. Three of the carbons come out right here, okay? 
for one molecule of GA3P. All three of these carbons came from the three molecules of carbon dioxide. The rest of this process is just regenerating. So 18 minus 3 would be 15, right? Is just regenerating the 15 carbon molecule that we hitched a ride on at the beginning. So key takeaway points, need ATP, need an ADPH. Rubisco is an important enzyme because it fixes carbon dioxide into this process. And every single carbon of glucose comes from a carbon in carbon dioxide, right? That's, that's, and that's what the reaction told us, that carbon dioxide gets reduced into glucose. Okay, lastly, so yes, we saw carbon dioxide fixation by a special enzyme called Rubisco. And we saw that carbon dioxide got reduced into what? Into glucose, which there's a there was an intermediary we talked at about, right? GO3P, but ultimately it gets reduced into glucose. We saw that NADPH and ATP were necessary in order to reduce CO2 into glucose or into the sugar. And the final part of the process was just regenerating that fifth, that RUBP that we essentially hitched a ride on from the beginning. Um, ignore this last question. All I want you to, I want you to make the connection that every carbon of glucose, so glucose has six carbons, right? All six of these carbons came from a molecule of carbon dioxide. So we, we have to have six CO2s for every one glucose that's produced in the Calvin cycle.